really a pleasure to be here today with you. Um, and I thought today we'd, we'd talk in specific about my area of interest, um, which is lung development. And we'd also talk about lung stem cells because stem cells seem to be in the news a lot. And they, I'm sure a lot of your students have questions about it more recently in, in your biology curriculum. And we'll see how those, those two things might be applied to the treatment of, of lung disease. Please stop me if you have any questions at all. Um, I don't think I have an hour and a half worth of material, so the more interactive it is, the better. Um, but the questions that we'll kind of look at today are, uh, with, with that kind of topic as a frame, is to ask the question, how are organs made in the embryo in general? And we'll use the lung as a specific example. And then how can the principles of developmental and stem cell biology, which we're just beginning to understand now, how can those be applied to understand organ biology in the adult organism? Uh, because this is a relatively new area that people are exploring now. And the third thing is, how can the tools of developmental and stem cell biology be used to study human disease, to take what we learn from the mouse and other organisms uh, back to people? And uh, in doing this, as we talk about the developmental biology of the lung, we'll really talk about two things. The first is lung organogenesis, um, the actual making of the lung during the embryo, the making of an organ architecturally. And then the lung that involves uh, a novel process called branching morphogenesis. And I'll show you in a little bit that that kind of branching pattern is a repeated iterative process of branching, much like a tree branches from a sprout. Uh, and then we'll talk about some new approaches to study the development of organs using the lung as an example. And then in the second half, we'll talk a little bit about lung stem cells and make the point that adult organs are a lot more vibrant and um, uh, dynamic than we generally portray them. We kind of think of the embryo as in involving a large amount of change. But it turns out that actually adult organs undergo a continuous kind of process of self-renewal. So that in the case, for example, of the lung, three months after a certain period, most of the lungs and most of the cells in that lung have actually turned over and are new again. So because of that, because of that basic fundamental principle, a lot about what you learn in the embryo about how cells develop get reapplied to actually the process of making new cells over the course of uh, adult life. And then we'll see if whether we think those stem cells might be able to be applied in disease states. Uh, and in specific, we'll talk about cystic fibrosis. Uh, because that, that'll be a good target. Um, this is a human embryo. It's about four weeks uh, after fertilization. And you see at this point, it's a relatively simple structure. The anatomy here is much less well understood uh, than kind of adult anatomy. I mean, we have a gross description of what the embryo looks like. But actually, all of the cell types and their various relationships are much less understood than they are in the adult, simply because it's received less attention. And part of the process of trying to figure out how organs are built is really to kind of just understand what cells are present in the embryo early on and what the relationships are of various cells, their, kind of their lineage, if you will. Um, but at this point, you see uh, the, the most prominent feature of this embryo is uh, other than the fact that it has a head and a tail and a connection to the umbilicus is that there's a, there's a heart uh, with two vascular tubes but right behind that, vas va right adjacent to that vascular tree, it p depicted in this light gray is this structure here, which is what the gut tube looks like in the embryo. And the organ that we'll be focusing on is just this little dot, this little bulge that occurs right behind the heart. And that structure will ultimately turn into the, into the lung bud and lung. Um, but at that stage, about in the human at least, about four weeks after fertilization, the gut tube that I showed you in gray before is here just depicted um, in yellow. And a day before this, or a couple of days before this, this would really just be at this magnification, just a cylindrical yellow tube. And you know, within a couple of days, these various bumps appear. And they're really, literally, at this point, morphologically, nothing more than that. Uh, the, the stomach and the lungs, the liver, and the dorsal pancreas, or the ventral pancreas, uh, look almost essentially the same. Um, there's very few markers of differentiation. There's no specialization. 
And part of the question as to how organs are made will revolve around the question of, you know, why does this become a stomach and how does it do so? And this bump that's just adjacent to it, why does it develop a dorsal pancreatic feature? And it should be much easier to tease apart at this stage of development where everything is so primitive that it would be to actually look at the adult and try to go backwards and decipher how a liver is different from a lung. Because there what we'd mostly be studying is how is the differentiated cells of those two populations different. We know they're extraordinarily different in the case of, of most adult organs. But here the idea basically is that this primitive endodermal tube should be relatively homogeneous. But, uh, but there's the first break of symmetry where part of it decides to become stomach and part of it decides to become pancreas. And he, here might be the easiest time to get at that question. Um, and so I'll just remind you uh, the, of the basic anatomy of the lung, and, and, but the major point that I'll make is just that the lung really can almost be considered two organs. There are the airways um, that are affected in diseases like asthma, which basically serve as conduits for moving air from the atmosphere down to the alveoli. And then there's the actual alveolar tissue distally. And I'll show you that on a histologic level, you can really kind of perhaps somewhat artificially, break the lung into two separate organs, the kind of airway tree and the, the alveolus, the gas exchange organ. And we'll kind of see that the histology of them looks different, the diseases of them are different, and there, by, by inference, the stem cell populations and the way those things turn, turn over will also be different. And that in, indeed turns out to be the case. It does beg the, beg the question in some way like, why do we decide to call something an organ? You know, why is there a small intestine and a large intestine? It is somewhat arbitrary. I mean, we could easily think of the small intestine perhaps as three organs, where there are three sort of regions of specialization. But, but it, get, it does get to the point that some of the stuff is nomenclature, and we just kind of art, arbitrarily label it as that. But you'll see here that we can, we, I think we can divide the lung into two clearly different regions with different behavior. Um, and as I said, the, it, this, this actually, you can map out these phases of production in the embryo where it's a lot clearer. The first part is when you produce those conducting airways, and only later actually, after that's formed, do you form the alveolar tissue uh, that forms these grape-like clusters later on. Um, so here is actually, if we focused in on that, that endodermal tube uh, at a higher resolution, that I show up here, and look just at this little bump here. It turns out it's actually not as simple as it looks. It's not just a simple bu bump. It turns out that there's this gut tube, and this whole region of that gut tube kind of evaginates forward. Um, so it's not just a little bump. It's actually a, almost an entire tube that's coming off that first tube. And, and then shortly thereafter, uh, two little bumps form off that tube. And this will actually become the future trachea, the main airway, and this will become the lung bud. And then in a kind of active process later on, the, these two tubes are sealed by the active growth of a septum between the, the gut tube and the lung, do, lung tube. And um, we'll see how that can go awry. Uh, in certain embryologic defects in a, be in, in a minute. But so this is the beginning where the lung is essentially formed and it's acquired its identity, but obviously none of its structure, aside from the fact that it has two sides, has been determined yet. Um, so now we might take a step back and I said you know, we're interested in how an undifferentiated cell becomes a lung or a liver or a pancreas. How can we actually approach this at kind of a molecular level? And for almost everything we do kind of in biology now, what we need is a, is a marker of the process that we're interested in. And then as opposed to studying the process globally, we kind of just look at that individual marker as a surrogate for the whole idea. So in, in, what I mean by that rather cryptic statement is, we need to find some specific molecule or something that we associate particularly with a lung. And then we can study that particular molecule in more detail rather than looking at the lung as a whole organ where there's so many things going on that it gets rather complicated. Uh, and what we do is we, we picked a certain gene and there is a special gene because the lungs function is so specific um, 
that only occurs in the lung and almost nowhere else. And, and those proteins are surfactant proteins, as I'm, as I'm sure you've taught about. Um, but but the, there are other genes like this, like for example, hemoglobin in red blood cells. But some tissues actually, it turns out that in some tissues it's extremely hard to find proteins or genes that are only expressed in that specific organ. It turns out actually during embryogenesis, there are very, very, very few genes that are associated with just one organ. We might think, for example, that there'd be a lung gene and that that gene would determine that that part of that tube turns into a lung. But it turns out that since evolution is so parsimonious, most genes that are expressed are expressed in multiple different locations and do different things in different places. Uh, so it doesn't turn out to, it doesn't turn out to be so simple. But but in in contrast, in adult organisms, there are very specific proteins because obviously you only need neurotransmitters in certain areas of the brain and the spinal cord, and you only need things that can bind oxygen in the bloodstream. Um, so it's actually easier to look at adult proteins. And this particular protein, surfactant, is peculiar to the lung um, and to kind of homologous. Uh, organs in fish, for example, the swim bladder, that have a similar kind of function. And its unique, its unique role, I'll just mention, is that one side of it is charged and the other side is hydrophobic, so that it can form micelles quite easily, like a soap. But in this, what its function in the lung is actually that the hydrophilic side binds to the tissue side and the hydrophobic side sees the air. So what this allows you to do is essentially reduce surface tension. Um, in the lung. Otherwise, much like any organ with a very high surface tension, uh, this will simply collapse the way a, a bubble collapses and tends to go to the state of lowest energy. So, so this uh, protein is unique to the lung because its function is so unique. Um, there's a, no other organ in the, in the human body that requires this. Um, so then, we, but instead of actually as uh, we might have done previously, assign most of our attention to the actual gene that controls surfactant protein C and look at its coding region, um, we actually shift to looking at the, at the DNA that's above stream, upstream of that coding region. Because this, this DNA is really the regulatory area that will tell this gene where to be expressed. So in this case, if we were studying the function of the surfactant protein, we might be more interested in the actual coding area for the amino acids of this protein. But here we want to really understand more about the regulatory regions to determine why this gene is only expressed in the lung. Because that'll give us, if you will, some insight, some handle into lungness. Like, why would a gene only get expressed in this organ? That's anyway, that's the idea. And I'll show you that it worked out relatively well. So one of the things that we can do rather easily now is that since we know the coding region is here somewhere in the chromosome, we can quite easily look at the region that comes <coughs> before it by, by simple molecular techniques now. And we can understand this kind of regulatory region that occurs upstream of this. Now one of the things we can do is identify sites where transcription factors bind. And the way we do that is to basically take this piece of DNA and cut it up into various chunks and uh, put those into cells and see when and if surfactant protein C is expressed. And if this regulatory region is present, then this gene gets expressed. But if the regulatory gene is absent, then that protein won't be expressed. And by, by serially going and cutting and snipping this proximal DNA, we can kind of narrow, hone in on the region uh, that's actually the transcription factor binding site. So that, that's the first step, to identify the regulatory region. And from there, it's a bit of biochemistry. Uh, it's not necessarily that easy, but now it's done routinely um, to identify the protein that comes and binds this regulatory region. And all these proteins are, are transcription factors. They're the genes that are, that are produced by the embryo, essentially to go in and regulate other genes. And this is the, our expectation for what a, a gene that controls cell fate or lineage would be. Because that gene would have to be able to coordinately regulate hundreds of different genes that turn you into, in this instance, a lung. Um, so we would expect it to be a transcription factor. And indeed, by just doing the process that I've kind of laid out for you, 
they identified a transcription factor called NCAGS 2.1. Um, the name is unimportant, it, but it's also called uh, thyroid transcription factor 1. And that kind of gets to the point that I mentioned already. This gene was like first identified actually from the thyroid gland. Um, and it turns out that, so, so in some sense we've already lost the game if we wanted the simplest answer. Because um, we're looking for a lung specific gene and I just told you that, we've, that it's called thyroid transcription factor. But you know, them's the breaks and that's the way it works. Um, but, what, but what you can do now, uh, it's a pretty much a six month experiment or a year long experiment, is really to just uh, do a knockout of a gene, and that is to eliminate it completely um, from a mouse's genome, where, where these experiments are most easily done now. And so if we eliminate the NKX2.1 gene from the mouse, it turns out that there's no alveolus, hardly any bronchus, and no mesenchymal lung structure. So it's actually pretty good proof of principle. There's essentially no lung, no substantial amount of lung in that tissue. So the, pr the rather kind of naive assumption that looking for the control elements of a specific protein would lead you to a gene that somehow determines organ fate actually turns out to, in principle, be true. But if you go ahead, if you look at these mice, it's a, they are a little bit more complicated. For example, their thyroid glands, as you might expect, are not completely normal either. Um, but what what? But, but we have found a lung, a lung, a gene that's necessary for lung development, uh, but not necessarily specific for it. It turns out that if you, look, if you look at this, there's a gene, we've talked about thyroid transcription factor one that's kind of around the lung. It turns out its pattern actually goes from about here to about here. And it turns out the thyroid gland develops right around here. And if you look at uh, the best gene for the pancreas, the most specific gene, it's called PDX1, um, it tends to go from the distal stomach out to the, to the proximal intestine, flanking this entire area. So in, in many of these cases, it turns out that there isn't like a single embryonic gene for a single organ. What we think is going to happen is that there's going to be overlapping sets of these genes. So this whole area from the distal stomach to the proximal intestine will express that gene PDX1. But there's going to be an overlap gene that somehow the intersection of those two genes, or maybe three genes, will determine exactly where you have a, a pancreas. And that's just starting to become elucidated. Um, but we think that's how it's, how it's going to work. We don't know yet. So NKX2.1 is absolutely necessary to make a thyroid gland or a lung. But something else is required to either make a lung on top of that or to suppress a thyroid gland. Now, both of these systems kind of work, actually. Um, sometimes there are genes that are absolutely necessary to shut off an organ, and sometimes there are genes that are necessary to turn off. Turn on in order. Hopefully, we'll know the answers to these in the next couple of years. Um, so, but how do we build an organ once we've even specified it? And I mentioned to you in the lung, it's this, it's this process of branching morphogenesis, and I'll try to describe that in a little bit more detail. Um, so here, you remember, you have this little bud off the endodermal tube right behind the heart, and then it forms this, this dichotomous branch, forming two little lung buds. Um, in the next day in the mouse, the mouse's gestation is only 19 days, so literally things are happening at this dramatic pace where, you know, a lung is specified in one day, in the next day you have two buds, in the next day you have the entire lobar structure, in the next day you have most of the bronchioli. So it's really kind of fascinating because you can watch, it would be fun to do as a science experiment, I think, in, in, uh, in high school because you can watch things from one day to the next and there's really a dramatic progression that's occurring. Um, and so you can see that one day after this, uh, or at a maximum two days after this, you see a substantial number of branches as each of these first branches continues to divide out. And then this process happens iteratively. But in another day, you essentially have the entire lobar structure of the lung set out. So the basic pattern, the fingerprint of the lung is set out. In the mouse, it turns that they're, they're there are these three branches here, and these two bran major branches here, and that's the way the adult lung looks, but this is where it comes from. Um, 
And, but at this stage, the lung doesn't look anything like it does in the adult state. It really, it's actually been labeled by classical pathologists and anatomists as the pseudoglandular phase. Because if you look at the thing, it does look a little bit like a tree, but it essentially looks like a gland, um, like a sweat gland, uh, for example. Um, and uh, in this phase, it can, the lung continues to look like this, at, but most of the airway tree is formed as the lung looks like this. And so this branch will then continue to form two branches, and then the tips on those will continue to bud out. And the same process seems to occur over and over again. It's only in the next phase, once you move from the pseudoglandular stage, where you have this columnar tall epithelium, that everything starts kind of thinning out. The, the capillaries that are formed kind of form a very intimate association with that epithelium. And then in the next phase, they start thinning out even further. Uh, and remarkably, by the end of gestation, you form this incredibly thin barrier of, of just 0.3 microns uh, between uh, a red blood cell located in a capillary um, and the airway that's right adjacent to it. It's really one of the you know, smallest epithelial barriers that exists anywhere. And if it gets even just a fraction larger, you can't exchange gas. So the structure is really exquisite. And it's only after birth, uh, particularly in the human, that uh, you actually even develop alveoli. Because at birth, um, the animal looks somewhat like this with these big saccules. It turns out this is sufficient to do gas exchange because babies do breathe. But it's in the first few years of life that these septae grow, and you ultimately get that grape-like structure um, of the, all the alveoli hanging off the main tree. Um, and so if I was giving this lecture to you maybe 15 years ago or so, the things I would tell you about where embryology matters to human disease or to adult lung biology would be things like this, bronchogenic cysts. And what those are is just a bud that somehow lost its parent trunk. Uh, somehow the bud just got separated from the trachea and it forms this cyst. And then sometimes because the lung secretes things, things get secreted into the cyst, and the cyst gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And ultimately, it causes someone some discomfort, because it's in your neck somewhere, it's in your chest, and it's growing and growing, and it starts compressing on other structures. But there, it's relatively, it's so rare, actually, that we don't even know how often it occurs. We assume that many times it's just there, and it's asymptomatic. But, and then there's the other kind of paradigmatic disease of, of lung development gone awry which is something called a tracheoesophageal fistula. This happens pretty commonly, one in 2,000 to one in 4,000 live births. And here what we see is actually that the lung sort of, uh, the trachea sort of just terminates before uh, binding to the rest of the distal lung. Um, it's just an airway that's separated from the lung further away from it. And there's often actually a communication with the esophagus. And those come in various flavors that aren't really necessary. But this is the kind of abnormality where it was thought that embryogenesis had gone awry and it's produced a congenital defect that then makes it impossible, for example, for a baby to breathe normally or to eat normally because what should be two separated tubes are now fused and they end in blind pouches. But again, relatively rare things. Um, and this is another one that's actually one of the most common serious uh, defects of kids, and that is, this is an x-ray, and you'll see, you can actually make the outlines of the heart here, and the area adjacent to it is a lot darker because um, it's filled with air, which is radiolucent. But this area is a lot more white than it should be, and the reason is because it contains a lot of water. And the reason in the case of this baby is because there's just a, mine, a small defect in the diaphragm. And because of the pressures uh, in the abdominal cavity are higher than in the lung, um, the entire intestine herniates up into the, into the rib cage area, into the thorax. And this causes this lung to fail to branch. Um, and so that, that would be kind of what we would have told you about. And th this again, relatively rare, one in 3,000 births. This is the kind of way we would have thought embryogenesis and developmental biology would have been relative, re relevant to human disease some 15 years ago or so. But as we'll see, I think developmental biology will be a lot more important to both diseases of childhood 
um, and in the adult. And I'll, I'll try to show you how. Um, but can, can we ask whether other model systems will teach us something more about human lung development other than the mouse? And it turns out that, that <coughs> the answer is yes, and that's why I'll mention it to you here. But this is actually a fly's trachea <coughs> system, and this is the, the equivalent of the, the larva of the fly. It's a, not an adult, and the outline of that maggot-like organism um, is, is right here. And it turns out that the respiratory organ of this uh, fly larva is completely different than a mammalian uh, respiratory tree. It actually, it, you could probably make out that it invaginates from the surface of the entire larva. And it kind of invades into the central cavity of that larva. And it also kind of divides throughout such that ultimately, you know, almost every cell is within a few cell diameters of a tiny little branch. But it's actually, so the exoskeleton of this, of this animal is, is kind of being invaded all around its circumference. And the tubes are kind of ramifying into the center. And this larva has no blood. So it's real, it's not, it is in the sense in, an organ involved in gas exchange. Um, and it does involve branching morphogenesis to some degree. But other than that, it's completely different than a mammalian one. So it, it is, it's somewhat surprising, I think, that similar mechanisms will apply. But, um, but they do indeed. And the reason why it's useful to go to the fly is, A, it's, it's extremely interesting for its own sake, but there are a number of other reasons. One, they're cheap and easy to take care of, lots of them, and mice are very expensive and difficult to take care of. But also, you can actually number each and every single cell in that airway, which is something you, know, you could never do in a human being or a mouse, um, or just because of the, how complex the organ is and the number of cells that you're dealing with. But here, since it's relatively simple, you can go ahead and label every single cell, and they occur in an extremely stereotyped pattern. I mean, this doesn't look too familiar to you or I, but to a Drosophila uh, tracheal biologist, this same pattern occurs every single time it's formed. And you can kind of see here where the nuclei of the, of the, the larva are depicted in black, that somehow or the other, an airway makes it to every single cell, or uh, adjacent to every single cell. Now the other advantage of the fly, unlike the mouse and certainly the human, is that you can do a lot of genetics by just doing crosses and following them. And you can do that very cheaply, and the generation time of those flies is so short that you can get answers to your experiments very, very fast. Um, and it turns out that they did this, and they essentially made mutations in hundreds of thousands of flies. That, was that were used for all sorts of purposes and all sorts of organs. But some investigators focused on the Drosophila tracheal system. And it turned out that they found three genes that turned out to be essential for kind of making a branch in that tree. One is FGF, which is fibroblast growth factor. It's just a kind of one of the cardinal growth factor systems that have been identified. Another is called breathless, uh, all, all, many of these Fly mutants have kind of interesting names, but they're, it's called breathless, obviously, because the trachea don't ramify into the fly. Um, and it turns out that this is the FGF receptor. And then a third, a third mutant fly that seemed to have an abnormal trachea was called sprouty because the sprouts of its tracheal system were not normal. And this turns out to be an inhibitor of FGF. And to summarize years and years of work, this is, this is the way it works. Initially, there's a little trachea it, the surface of the fly will be out here somewhere. And there's a little bud of a trachea um, that's, that is summoned into the fly larva by a signal of FGF. And then it turns out that at the tip, on those tip cells of this tracheal bud here and here, there's the presence of FGF receptor, which can respond to this gradient of FGF. And what it does in response to that gradient of FGF is divide and move. So, so FGF is both a mitogen making these cells divide and a motogen making it divide and move in a certain direction so that the branch starts growing into this FGF source. Um, and it continues to do that until it lengthens out. Then a very kind of interesting things happens right when 
the branch, when the tip touches this FGF source, somehow, and it's not completely understood how, Sprouty gets made right at that point. Um, and Sprouty inhibits FGF. So what happens is this tip was being summoned up to this source, and ultimately the tip bumps into the source, and all of a sudden an inhibitor of that initial induction is made right at the tip. So what, stop, what happens is that the tip stops growing because the inhibitor is present. But the cells on either side of that tip are still seeing FGF from the surround. So they kind of decide to branch out. So that's essentially how you get a branch. Um, from a, a single epithelial tube turns into two epithelial tubes. And it's kind of very elegant, simplistic system. Um, and it turns out that then later, only, only a few years after it was first sorted out in the fly, people decided to take a wild guess and look at the same system in the, in the mouse. And it turns out that something very, very similar happens. That FGF10, in this case, out in the mesenchyme somewhere in the body, in, in the future shell of the lung, summons out a branch. Uh, and it, that molecule, again, acts as a mitogen and a motogen for these tip cells. And the, so in some ways, you can kind of think as the trunk is kind of static. It's done its thing. And the tip is just where all the growth is occurring. Uh, and ultimately, of course, sprouty or sprouty-like molecule will get formed right at this tip and then two new tips are formed that then branch out. And that just keeps going on and on. Yes? Are the, the molecules in the mice homologous at the, you know, the DNA level? Um, well, it's the same signaling pathway, but it's a rather complicated question because the fly and the human or the mouse are so divergent, we're not even sure exactly what the ancestral or the root organism should be. That's why some of this is kind of just amazing that the same system would be working in both. But uh, the reason I mention is that is because the FGF pathway has undergone so much evolutionary modification over time, and and it's big. There's so many more FGFs in a in a mammalian system than the root organism that we can't even say which FGF corresponds to. Um, the primordial FGF, if you will. Since Drosophila has so fewer of them, you know, we know that this was more like the root FGF. And presumably there was just one. But the, this is FGF 10, but I think now there's like FGF 20 something. So that, you know, there's a lot of complexity. Has but they're all basically over. They're all the basically same the same. The Sprouty as well. And, and no, the Sprouty's completely different. Um, it's just an, uh, an antagonist will often be different than, than uh, the the, the growth factor itself. They'll be from a completely different line. But also, I mean, so it kind of gets back to a point where we mentioned before, FGF10 is used in like, I would guess, a third of the organs in the body. And in many of those organs, it's used kind of as a mitogen. Um, but it can also be used to determine cell fate, um, and it can, it, and it, all of its, and sometimes it's just a, 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 a motogen, that is to make cells move, and sometimes it's, it's a chemo attractant, summoning cells in a specific direction. So a single molecule even in one organism, depending on which organ you look at it in, is doing you know, very different things. Um, it's pretty amazing. Yep. Does FGF seem to have some other kind of function that maybe through evolution there was a switch from you know, lung development or tracheal development to something else? Um, so I think it's even more, um, I mean, the answer to your question is, is yes, but it's even more fundamental than the respiratory system. You know, the, it's, there are about seven, at a maximum, about 10 major growth factor signaling pathways um, that cause cells to replicate, affect cell fate, do those kind of very important things in embryogenesis. Since there's only 10 of them, and there's so many cell fate choices that the embryo has to make, and so many things, you know, so many replications, so many cell fate divisions, so many migrations, that each of these molecules has to be used over and over again in different systems for different things. So you can kind of almost think of it as just a toolkit. You know, the genome of the cell has this protein in there somewhere. And 
if it's not already being used for something else, then during the course of evolution, it was available to get co-opted for some other process. It's as though you had a screwdriver or something, and you just needed, you know, to to do the process at some point, and these things reached for it. So there's a certain amount of kind of logic that you can assign things, but since evolution involves so much accident, a lot of times it doesn't quite make perfect sense. Uh, because I think it was just the most available molecule. And it was the one that, you know, by random mutation got selected to get expressed somewhere and have a function. So uh, and that's why I think it's kind of amazing that you can actually even go back and see this parallel between the fly and, and a mammalian organism where the structures are so different. Um, and, you know, and it's in, it turns out that the pancreas actually grows a little bit like budding, although it's a lot less obvious based on its structure. And the kidney does actually bud. So this is one of the kind of cardinal manifest, kind of cardinal modes of growth for any organ uh, in the body. Not all of them do. For example, the brain forms as kind of a shell. Uh, and the epithelium kind of just forms as layers from a germinative layer. Um, so that's another kind of paradigmatic way that an organ can grow. But there's only like three or four basic processes. And, and uh, this, this and these molecules will get used over and over again for those things. It does turn out, though, that the, you know, since the mouse is so much more complicated than the fly, um, and there's a vascular tree for the larva, as I mentioned, doesn't even have blood vessels. It just has a kind of sac of fluid. Um, uh, so that a, a large degree of complexity had to be built into the mouse uh, if you were starting from some root organism that looked more like the fly. And so because of that, a myriad, a host of other molecules are involved here. And some of them affect the smooth muscle, like sonic hedgehog, that gets formed around the lung and allows the airway to kind of expand and contract. Um, some of them affect the blood vessels, and it actually, actually an airway summons a blood vessel and a blood vessel in reciprocity summons an airway. And the idea there is probably that they need to be almost 100% perfectly matched in order to have a gas exchange organ. Because if you didn't have one alveolus to one capillary, you'd really be, you'd really be unable to achieve the physiologic process. So although the same basic fundamental process is there, um, the mam mammal has orders and orders of complexity built upon the system that we find in the fly. So that's kind of a classic genetic approach to how we could dissect out organogenesis. And it's only now being applied to the mouse uh, in great detail. But you know what can be done in the fly in the order of a few years will take many more uh, in the mouse, at least with current technology, just because you know, a generation of a mouse you know, takes at least three months before you can get another mating going for another generation. And there are many, many more molecules. So to actually tease this apart at the level of single experiments is going to take uh, quite a bit, quite a bit longer than you can solve the problem in, in the fly. Um, so we we need to resort to kind of other methodologies to kind of get a better handle faster, and this is one of them that we've kind of taken in the lung. Uh, now that the genomes have been kind of fully annotated, or not fully annotated, but at least at, at first pass we have a, a map of the entire genome of the mouse and the human. We can actually look through that uh, in a bioinformatic way and look for a kind of every gene that we think is there. I mean, some of it is guesswork. We, we just guess that a stretch of nucleotides looks like a gene. Um, but to a first approximation, we can guess how many genes there are. And we can look for evolutionary conservation and guess that they're transcription factors. And it turns out, this is kind of amazing, of those regulatory genes that affect other genes, these transcription factors, we've only found in the mouse about 1,400 of them or so. So all, about 1,400 genes are responsible for making the decisions, the kind of master regulatory decisions um, that decide a cell to become one kind of cell or another which is a relatively small number, but it allows you a, a sufficient flexibility, obviously. Um, but, and we looked at what was available then, about 1,250 of them, and we decided to just do the simplest thing, and that is just to see where they are. Um, and this is actually looking in blue at the RNA that's produced from that gene so that we know that they're on. 
And we just said, well, these are, this is every single transcription factor that should be in the genome, or as many as we can find. And we're just going to try to look at a, a lung that's, that's very early on in its development and see where the genes are and see if anything interesting pops out. And it, it actually, it does. Um, it turns out that this gene is right on, as you can probably see, right at the very tips of the, of the lung, um, but is lost kind of more proximally and even in the airway is lost. And I'll show you other examples of how these transcription factors work. This, by the way, is what that lung bud looks like in real life and not as a cartoon. It's kind of pretty, it's just this tiny little bump that occurs right behind the heart. And we screened also for those genes. And it turns out that at this stage, pretty remarkably, of those 1,250 or 1,400 genes, only about nine of them had lit up this tiny little lung bud. So now we're at a number where we can start to really play. You know, nine is a number where you can try doing various combinations. And here now we can start doing the kind of experiments where we say, well, if some combo of those nine genes makes a lung, then if we express some of those nine genes in the esophagus, we should be able to convert it from, from esophagus into lung tissue or into tracheal tissue. So those experiments are beginning now, but we, we don't have the answer to that. But it's a different kind of experiment. You can always, like I showed you before, knock out NKX 2.1 and not have a lung, which tells you that a gene is necessary for something in an embryo. Um, but it's much harder to actually get um, the, specific, the specific role of that gene. For example, if I knocked out the Krebs cycle gene in the lung, I presumably wouldn't get a lung because it can't work without that. So it's uh, just a lot less stringent criteria to have something that's necessary to, to, to form a gene versus something that's actually sufficient to make, make an organ. And we're now in the position to actually ask about sufficiency. Like, you know, are, is this set of genes enough to make you into a certain kind of organ? So th those experiments are underway. And um, so I'll just show you a bunch of pictures for fun, but you can kind of see that this, this gene, again, is one of those that's just expressed in the tip, and you can see it's not at all on in the trachea. And this is just a higher resolution. You can see, actually, that it's on in the extreme, very, very tip, where we think most of the growth is occurring. So we're very interested in these genes because these are probably the stem and progenitor cells of the lung, where all the growth is occurring right at the very tip. Um, and interestingly enough, there are about 200 of those 1,400 transcription factors, maybe 100, that are on in the lung. Those, those are the only ones responsible for lung development. But the vast majority of them are expressed out here, the tip, like this pattern. And all of the rest of the patterns turn out to be exceedingly rare. And one of the themes that has emerged um, recently is that uh, stem cells express lots of different genes. Um, they're kind of promiscuous in this fashion. And we think that, one, this is kind of a hand-waving explanation, but we think much of development involves not the actual acquisition of the making of new gene products, but what it is is shutting off all the other things that you shouldn't be, um, and that you're only left with the organ that you that you want want to be. So that uh, one of the themes that's emerging is that there does seem to be in early cells promiscuous expression. And then it's kind of paring down until you get more and more and more specific, which isn't the way it would have to work, but that seems to be a kind of recurrent theme nowadays. For example, in um, the bone marrow, when you look at early progenitor cells, you have proteins that are associated with red blood cells and white blood cells in the progenitor cells. So the progenitor cells are making everything. And then in one lineage, the red blood cell proteins are shut down, and in the other, the white white blood cell lineage. There's a lot of evolutionary biology kind of um, explanations for why that might be the way it is, but what we can say now is that that is, seems to be a kind of recurrent theme, but we don't know why. Yeah? So that you're saying that the gene get turned on uh, 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 in a gross way, and then they later on get turned off? Yes, yes. So there are many, and we, we just know a lot less about the biology of the embryo. Like, for example, in the adult, we know about many proteins that communicate between the kidney and the liver, or at least a few. Uh, but we don't have any of that kind of insight into the embryo because um, mostly, I think, because we know about those kind of genes in the adult because they go wrong in human diseases, and then we measure them and we learn about them. 
but you know when an embryo goes wrong we don't even usually find out about it you know it was like a we, you would never know about it so a lot less of this detail is known so I, I mention that only because I think that promiscuous gene expression it might just be the way the system is set up but some of those genes might actually have functions that we just don't know about but to a first approximation, it looks as though there's a lot of stuff that's on that isn't really necessary to be on. Um, it's, uh, to just give you some of those hand-waving explanations that aren't certain yet, it seems as though, you know, one of the things that happens is uh, DNA methylation and acetylation, which causes chromatin, <coughs> whole regions of chromatin to shut down. So we think that's part of what happens, like you're, you're the early progenitor cells are kind of plastic and available for multiple different cell fates depending on the signals they get. Once they decide, for example, to become a pancreas, they actually methylate all the other regions down. And then that gets, shuts them down tight. Because it would be catastrophic to have, for example, pancreatic digestive enzymes expressed in the brain. Um, so there's, there's kind of this more or less irreversible switch that's thrown. Um, and that's why cloning is such an amazing thing, actually, that you can take one of those differentiated nuclei where all of this stuff is more or less irreversibly shut down, and you can kind of wake up all that DNA uh, again and get it to reactivate. But it's sort of like now there's just throwing all the genes up against the wall and see which ones stick. Yeah, yeah, it's, in some ways it's kind of, it, it, is, it is interesting. I mean, there's a lot more noise. There's a lot more noise um, in, in the embryo. It makes it actually a little bit hard because you don't know. In the adult, we can we can take a look at a red blood cell, and we can ask what proteins are made in that red blood cell, and we're almost certain that they all have they have some reason for being there, if you will. Telia, like we know hemoglobin, it's so so much of a red blood cell is made of that. We knew that it would have to have a function. In the embryo, you have all this noise. That's kind of hard to find out which gene should be important and which gene shouldn't be as important. Some of that is associated with the level of the protein, but that can turn out to be uh, a red hair. Um, so you really have to go out and mutate those genes to figure out what they do. Any other questions? And then here's a, here, here, this is another gene, and this you can see labels the entire airway tree. But the amazing thing is that this is the only gene of its kind that we found. So this is a kind of different way of saying this gene is probably important, since it has this very, very ex specific expression pattern, but it's the only one of its kind out of like all of the transcription factors in the body. So it probably has something to do with kind of the maintenance or the differentiation of these cells towards an airway thing. And it gets pretty specific. We can find the, another gene that's just in the ciliated cells of the trachea uh, as they're growing. And this gene actually, it turns out, wasn't identified previously. And when you knock it out, you get abnormal ciliary cells. So um, we're, we're guessing that these extremely rare genes, they'll all have functions um, just because they're so unique. There must be a reason for them to be there. And then this is a different pattern. It's like. Here is the epithelial tips that you saw before, and here it's everything else, the future blood vessels, the future smooth muscle, it's all completely expressing this gene, but not the epithelium. It's kind of hard to see it in a light blue here. So there's a gene that's discriminating between those. And then, you know, we were surprised to find even genes specific for blood vessels that are kind of coming into the lung. And, and even more remarkably, there were different genes for the bigger blood vessels and for the tiny little capillaries and you know you as you might express a tiny little capillary gene will be on in the lung but it'll also be on in other places that require capillaries and then you know even th this was a real surprise to me that you know even the pulmonary artery for example would have a gene that seemed relatively specific for that but I guess it must be the case but it's just surprising when things work out so simply sometimes um, but but there it is and then, you know, a gene for the cartilaginous rings that are kind of occur in the trachea. Yep. So when you say it's specific for the pulmonary artery, does that mean within the lung system or yes. within the entire body? Within the lung system. Have you looked at like other? It like is the in other places in the body. Yes. 
But it, even there, it kind of has a tendency to label a particular kind of blood vessel. So it's probably used as an address system of sorts, if you will. Like it's a gene that will help, for example, distinguish the pulmonary artery from the capillary um, and the pulmonary artery from the pulmonary vein. Um, but then, again, it gets used in a different organ, and maybe it separates out the renal artery from the renal vein and the renal capillaries. Um, and that's just this, you know, again, the same theme, that the same proteins are used in different organs for different reasons. But sometimes you can see a commonality uh, of how they're deployed. It, it turns out, actually, in this case, that um, it's just a tangent, but this gene was previously identified. It's called EPAS1. Uh, and it turns out that it is a gene that decides whether you're an artery or a vein. So this actually turns out to be the pulmonary artery, but if you mutate it, that vessel starts looking much more like a pulmonary vein. Um, so this was this is kind of a big surprise. It was a cell paper about a year ago or something like that, that a single gene could make that switch. You know, it almost seems too simple uh, and, and surprising, but that's the way it turned out. Um, and then, so the kind of common theme that emerged from the, the, these studies is that when you look at the embryo, things get a lot more simple because they're just fewer cell types and they're more primordial. Um, so when you look at an adult lung, for example, and I'm sure this applies to most organs, there are hundreds, well, in the lung supposedly 108 cell types. I can't even name them all, it's so complicated. But it turns out when we look at the embryo and we look at these patterns of gene expression, we can only identify four major cell types. Um, so in this way, I think we can start teasing apart where different cells come from by starting here and then seeing how it's built, built from this kind of early, early patterning. Um, the other neat thing that we can do um, is actually take out, this is a piece of lung bud um, that we've dissected out of a little mouse embryo. And fortunately, um, we can grow that in a tissue culture dish. This is another fun thing to do if, if you have an incubator or something, because you can watch this branching process occur over the course of two to three days. And this really largely mimics what's happening in, vi in, vi uh, in vivo in the mouse. And it turns out that you know, if you stain this, you'll find smooth muscle, and you'll find capillaries, and you'll find most of the proteins expressed in the right place at the right time. Um, it, it all slows down. What takes like a week in the mouse takes three days in the tissue culture hood. But that seems to be a pretty common um, phenomenon, partly maybe because there isn't an active blood system um, in the tissue culture. But this now gives us a kind of neat assay because we can grow this organ now uh, in a tissue culture dish and we can inject it with needles. And because of that, we can go ahead and this is a picture of just taking a virus that expresses a GFP, which is a green fluorescent protein, and injecting that virus into the lung bud, which is, you know, all over here. And you can get that, that GFP protein to be expressed now within the lung cells. So the idea now is, well, we have about 100 genes that are important in lung function. We can go ahead and now test each of them kind of individually to see what they do. So if we thought there was a gene that makes you an artery and not a vein, we could inject that artery gene into a vein and see does it convert is it sufficient to give you that kind of uh, result. So this is, this is great because to do those experiments actually in a mouse would take years and a lot of money. But here you can kind of simplify this process and do it in a tissue culture hood a lot faster and a lot cheaper. And do combinations. Like you know, <coughs> if you had five to 10 genes, there's no way you could do that kind of experiment in a mouse because you have to make each of those separate mice and then mate them all together. And it's really almost untenable. I think the most people have done is about four genes. Um, and only in a very few cases have people actively looked at the interaction of four genes in a living mouse because it's just so difficult. But when you can ex abstract it to a tissue culture system, then, you, then you're in business and you can start, start getting more and more complex. The sacrifice is it isn't perfectly normal. You know, it's a surrogate system. So I thought we'd switch uh, now from kind of uh, molecular developmental biology to talk a little bit about stem cells. And uh, have, has, has, have stem cells made it into the biology curriculum um, in high school? So you, you do? Oh. Yeah, yeah. 
I can. I, I hope they'll Super be uh, more and more in the system because it's a it's a fascinating topic that you know I think it's it's interesting because it's one of those things that has been around for hundreds of years, but um, at least a hundred years, but it didn't really receive that much attention until human embryonic stem cells were made, and that kind of that kind of just that focus of attention was very interesting, not just for the public but for scientists alike because it changed the way we look at some systems. And I'll try to show you, uh, I'll try to show you how it kind of changed the way we looked at Malone. Broadly speaking, there are two kinds of stem cells. And um, there are the embryonic stem cells that are the most primitive of the stem cells. We value them because they can form all the cell types of the body, we think. And they're essentially immortal in culture. I mean, this isn't quite true. They acquire mutations over time, and they, they get weird karyotypes. Um, but, they, but suffice it to say, we can pass them for a long time in an incubator. And they're plentiful once you have one. But of course, in the case of the human, it's very difficult to just get one. And there are a lot of implications to that. But once you have a line, they're plentiful. The adult stem cell is more interesting for certain purposes because it's organ specific. So you presumably, or we think it is, so you don't have to teach it how to become an organ in the first place because presumably it has an address built into it already. Um, it, it, therefore it has the virtue or the problem, depending on how you look at it, of forming just a few cell types. But for cell therapy this is probably a good thing. Like for example in the case of bone marrow transplants, you wouldn't want those bone marrow cells to become other kinds of cell types. You want them to be very specific. They also have a, unfortunately, they have a very limited lifespan and culture. In general, even in the case of bone marrow, um, you can't really grow them very long, and you can't expand them. So as a therapeutic tool, they're kind of difficult to use because you don't have an unlimited supply of them. And they're also extremely hard to isolate in general because you have to do something invasive to an adult um, to get them. And depending on what organ, if you were talking about a brain stem cell, I mean, this would really be almost prohibitive to get. It turns out it's easier in the case of the lung, which is good good for the purposes that we're thinking about there. But, so this is a kind of schematic of uh, embryogenesis. Um, and I just pointed out, just to point out where embryonic stem cells come from, you first have the fertilized egg, and the first decision you make is to make something called an inner cell mass, which will form most of the, all of the embryo proper, really, the ectoderm, the endoderm, and the mesoderm. And then you have the trophectoderm that forms the placenta. Um, and the inner cell mass also, and this varies by species, can develop extra embryonic parts of the embryo as well, like the yolk sac. Um, but these inner cell mass cells, if they're isolated in a petri dish with the appropriate um, growth factors, will grow out and form embryonic stem cells. And then it's these cells that you can actually go back and essentially form most of what the inner cell mass can form. That is all these things. But the problem is actually then you have a huge number of things to teach the cell to become if you want to make one. Um, you have to first, you know, make it commit to epiblast and not hypoblast. Then you have to make it commit to be just one of these germ layers. And then you have to make it commit to be the specific organ that you're interested in. And that's a whole lot of biology um, that really is kind of a, as I told you earlier on, we're just beginning to understand why certain organs are, are what they are. Um, so it, it's a, a huge problem to form, uh, to take these very, very primitive cells and make anything like these differentiated organs. In a few cases, it turns out to be rather simple, like making nerves. Um, but for the most part, it remains a very challenging problem. Um, the major property of stem cells that may get us interested in it is that they do two things. They can, they're can they primitive cells that can ultimately make differentiated cells, but they also have this capacity for self-renewal, which is their key um, and what makes them so exciting. And um, in the lung, if we look at the two tissues of the lung, we have the distal alveolus and we have the airway. And we can see, you know, just at first pass, they look so incredibly different that they're almost certainly going to have a different biology, and they have different diseases. Um, and it turns out that they indeed also have different properties for regeneration. If you cut out the distal lung, for example, if someone has a lung cancer or if a baby has a congenital problem, that area of the lung essentially just is lost. So whatever fracture of the lung you take out from a young baby 
that fraction of lung function that baby will never have as an adult. Um, and this is in distinction to the proximal epithelium, where, for example, if a firefighter goes into a, a burning room and kind of singes by breathing in kind of heated fumes um, and destroys their basic, their tracheal epithelium, they'll kind of cough and uh, not be too happy for three weeks, four weeks. And then after that, they'll actually return back to normal. And so that, although it was known to be the case, it wasn't that well appreciated. But it turns out that this proximal epithelium has a profound and robust capacity to regenerate that wasn't really appreciated until recently. If you look at the mature lung, there's so many different cell types. I'll just uh, bring your attention to the tracheal cell types. There are these basal cells, ciliated cells that help uh, mucus move along glands that make the mucus, goblet cells that make mucus, and neuroendocrine cells, which we don't really understand the function of. And then there are these things called clara cells, which, we, which are detoxifying cells. But all these cells have to come from somewhere. And the interesting thing is, if a firefighter does burn away his epithelium, and in three months he has an entirely new epithelium, the question is, you know, how, how does that happen? How does that remarkable process happen? And it turns out that I also draw this very basic distinction. There are some tissues that are just undergoing constant self renewal. And the classic ones are, for example, the skin, the bone marrow, and the intestinal layer are kind of constantly turning over. And essentially, if you look three months from the beginning point of time, they're essentially all new in that process, that all of those cells have undergone division. And when we give chemotherapy, essentially, you know, cell division toxins, um, those are the organs that first get affected. Um, and they, they cause a lot of problems. But the airway, no, because the airway is, is in a different category. It's, it's more like the skin than those other two organs. And that is, it doesn't do that much at, in, in normal circumstances. But once you injure it, it undergoes a profound transformation and kind of becomes a regenerative organ where there's enormous amount of replication uh, and then differentiation. So one of the questions is, is that process of regeneration, is that the same as just embryogenesis redone? Um, or is it distinct and different? Yeah, and that's one of the kind of big questions in regenerative medicine and developmental biology now, for which we're just starting to get the answer. So, so when, if you were going to look for an easy to find stem cell that had some applications, you wouldn't look down here. Uh, because as in the case of emphysema or in the case of a resection for lung cancer, the alveoli don't grow back. Or they do so in a kind of frustrated way. Um, they don't do it well. Whereas this epithelium seems to grow back very, very well. So that's where we'll search. Um, this is just a labeling of the epithelium in red. And you can kind of see these deep glands. So there's probably about 15 different cells that you could find um, in here. And it turns out that you, when you look at the literature, almost every single one of those cells has become uh, called a stem cell. And the reason for that is I think the techniques up until recently just haven't been that good. And they've mostly consisted of kind of damaging the airway uh, and then looking under a microscope and trying to decipher based on the morphology who's replicating and who's not. But that can be an extremely confusing, essentially impossible task. So all you can do is, is make best guesses. So someone or the other has guessed almost every one of these cells has that capacity. Um, and they probably do in some measure. But um, so this, this cell has been called a stem cell. This has, this has, this has, this has, this one has. It. So you can see it's a relatively common assignation. But one, here's a remarkable experiment, something that's a little bit paradoxical. Um, that is the question, I might ask you, like, how fast do stem cells replicate, just in a, in a, a relative kind of way? I wonder what your answers might be. Okay. What? Oh, I don't even mean in terms of time, like, compared to the rest of the body, are they fast, slow, average? Fast. Well, it depends if they get the best. <laughs> what stage I mean, they get... Yeah, so well, actually all these answers are, are right. I think um, <laughs> uh, it's, um, yeah, it's an easy, easy test to draw. But the paradox is actually that since 
it depends on the, what the organ has to do, uh, how that stem cell has to behave. So many of the organs are relatively static until you're injured, and then they get called into action. So it turns out that the actual stem cells divide very rarely in most cells. It's a little bit counterintuitive, because you would think a stem cell would be doing its thing all the time. Yep. Are you talking about embryonic stem cells or adult stem cells? Oh, no. In the embryo, pretty much everything is replicating all the time. Okay. That, so this is, you're talking about adult ones. The adult, okay. yes. Yeah, sorry. In the embryo, you, it's, you're hard-pressed to find a single cell that isn't replicated because everything is growing at such an enormous rate. And that's fast. Yes, very okay. fast. That's about as fast as it can be, you know, a, a little shorter than a day. That's about as fast as a cell can do its replication time. And so the embryo is just going full speed ahead. It turns out that in many adult organs, the stem cells replicate very, very slowly. We think there's a teleologic reason for this, which is kind of interesting. Again, it's the thing that's impossible to prove until you have a lot of evidence, is that the, the teleologic reason for that is these stem, you want to protect these stem cells from injury. So you don't want them to be doing too many cell divisions because you don't want that DNA to get damaged. Um, because it, should, it has to last you for your lifetime. Um, so what happens is the stem cell rarely divides. But when it divides, it makes another cell called a transit amplifying cell that can go to town and just make a huge number of cells. Um, and, and those cells do what we conventionally might have thought of as a stem cell doing. They, they undergo exponential amplification um, in number. But the stem cells themselves, it turns out, are very quiescent. Um, so how do we find them? Well, a, there was this, I'll just show you this experiment because I think it's one of the, the best ones in uh, developmental biology in maybe 10 years or so. Um, Elaine Fuchs down in Rockefeller did this experiment where using a fluorescent tag, she could ident essentially identify, it's a very busy slide, but it, she could identify cells that don't replicate fast uh, on the basis of a green fluorescent protein. And the way that would work is she turned on this green fluorescent protein and then she let cells divide. But cells that divided would essentially dilute out this protein pretty fast. And the faster you divide it, the faster you dilute out the protein as it kind of just got lost um, in, in the sea of replication. But there were a few cells that would remain bright green, meaning that they hardly divided. And when she isolated those cells um, from the skin of a wild-type mouse, she actually transplanted those cells onto the back of what we call a nude mouse because it doesn't have normal skin. And it turns out that when you transplant those cells, you basically get a tuft of skin with its hair, which the nude mouse doesn't have. And it turns out that, that those, those hair cells are all completely green when you look at them under a fluorescent light. So they're kind of probably the best proof anywhere that you could find a single stem cell that you could kind of, you know, it's rare to actually be able to point to a cell and say that's a stem cell. And she's actually done that experiment here by just identifying cells that, that rarely divide. It's such a simple kind of criterion but that was sufficient to kind of identify this unique cell population. In most cases, even in the case of bone marrow, you can't really point to a single cell uh, and say that's a stem cell. What you do is you isolate this large population of cells that express certain antibodies, and you know that those cells are in there somewhere, but you're not sure which ones they are, um, and you're just thankful that somewhere within that mix is a cell that can kind of repopulate the bone marrow. So this is kind of unusual and, and really kind of dramatic. So we've used that same technique to, and this is, a, this is a lung, and this is kind of the alveolar tissue, and this is an airway. And we see that we can identify just these bright green cells in the airway. So we're now in the process of kind of testing whether those things might be stem cells, which we suspect they are. Um, the other interesting thing is, these look like basal cells. You see that they're, they're at the bottom of the airway, and hence they're called basal cells, and they express a certain kind of marker. But they're basal cells lining the entire ring. And so previously, people said, well, those basal cells that line the entire ring, those are stem cells, one of the five or six cells that people said are stem cells. But right off the bat, this experiment implies that not all basal cells are the same in the first place, that they're special cells that hardly ever replicate. Yep. So instead of putting green fluorescent protein in there, if you, what if you put like a marker, a unique marker in, in the cells that could use that to isolate 
We can do that, um, and we can do that now, but the problem with a unique marker, well, we can't do it quite yet. The problem with a unique marker is you have to know something about those cells. And we didn't even know that this heterogeneity existed, you know, that they were slow dividing and fast dividing cells. So the first thing you have to do is just even identify the phenomenology. Now, since these are green and these aren't green, we can go ahead and separate those two cells, look for differences, find a gene that's only on in one but not the other, and then use that to label those cells. Um, but in this first instance, we'll just actually uh, identify them by their behavior. You know, that is that they hardly replicate. Yep. I was thinking, what if you put a marker in them? Yeah. You know, get them to express something on the surface of the cell. Yes. And then that would get diluted out, except in the stem cells, then you could pull them out with them? Oh, you mean just like some protein that fluoresced and put them on all the cells and just let a few of them dilute out? Right, some cell surface. That okay. could that could be done. Um, the problem with most of those are like lipophilic dyes that have been used in kind of classic embryology, and they were used for these cell fate maps. The idea being, you took this embryo, you kind of dabbed on a little bit of dye onto just one cell, and you saw what that, where that green was, like it was in the heart and the liver, and it suggested that those cells then became the heart and the liver. Mm -hmm. The problem is it dilutes out so fast um, that there isn't really a good tracking system that we can I mean, do. if you put like something that became an antigen on the surface of the cell and then and then use like a cell sorter or something. Yeah, you could, theor around. you could theoretically do those kind of things. Um, but this is probably the most like uh, technically tractable because you, not only is it simple and the molecules used all the time, but you can sort them immediately because some of them are fluoresce green and some of them don't. So you don't have to do anything else. You just go straight for the green ones. The other kind of interesting thing about this that you might note that, you know, do, do, none of these things ever occur to you immediately, but if you look at it, you notice that there aren't light green cells. And it turns out the other way you might have expected this to happen was to get like a histogram, you know, of some light green cells, some average green cells, and some very, very bright green cells, like as though it was just a random process. And you'd identify guys that were in different stages of things. But here, this is really extremely dichotomous. You know, you're either bright green or you're blue, um, meaning that these cells really they do have a different biology. They're not. It's not just a random stochastic event that's occurring. Um, and we can now, you know, attempt to culture these cells, differentiate them, and hopefully transplant them. I won't take you through all of this, but since we're running out of time, but I will mention. Um, I'll show you a couple of CT scans. This is a disease called cystic fibrosis um, that is, I think, one of the best targets for stem cells in, uh, in humans um, and certainly in the lung. This is the kind of pathology. You'll see that the lung is basically just eaten away with these large holes and hence giving it the name of cystic fibrosis. There's this fibrous tissue and these large cysts and it's extremely abnormal. Um, and, and amazingly, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible to read the literature sometimes. People realized back in the 1950s that the salt concentration of the sweat in these patients was not normal. Um, how they got to this is, is just remarkable that they were even able to figure this out. But they did get to that. Um, and only a long time after they actually understood what was wrong, that the tonicity of the uh, fluid was not right, did they clone the gene? And that, that was only recently in 1989. And then it turns out that that cloning of the gene has not been very useful at all. You know, it, it, it was useful in figuring out what the problem was, but it hasn't led to any kind of therapeutic intervention, unfortunately. Um, so now patients do live into their 30s, um, but most of it is because we have good antibiotics and, you know, very careful attention and basically supportive stuff. There's really nothing curative. And many of you probably remember that there was a lot of enthusiasm about gene therapy in this disorder, since it is the most common autosomal recessive disease that's lethal. Um, it was one of the early targets, but they just it failed you know, miserably. Um, and um, this is a good disease, I think, to go after in a regenerative medicine kind of approach, because it is lethal. Uh, it does affect very young people. Um, and it's kind of an obvious hurdle for, for molecular me medicine because it's just a single gene 
often with just this small deletion in the gene. It's a lot like sickle cell anemia. The, the initial problem is not very complex at all. It's just this, what's, what's almost could be described of as trivial. Um, but I think one of the reasons why, so this just says that again, that a good reason why we might target this disease is because there's a simple cause that we actually understand, but we can't do much about. And also that the airways regenerate profoundly. So what was tried previously was much like taking virus that expressed the right gene and putting, them, putting it onto the surface of the skin. But where you might imagine those cells would wind up in a week or two is actually sloughed off and on the floor somewhere. Um, and that's exactly what happened actually in here. And it's probably even worse because you put this protein and this virus into these cells that are recognized by the immune system as being abnormal and the immune system doesn't want them there, so it generates a little attack on them. So for two reasons, it was kind of a, a, a difficult strategy. So we think that the cure will actually depend on understanding the regeneration and characterizing those progenitors. Because if we can get the gene into the progenitor cell, then that's the cell that's actually responsible for constantly making new epithelium. So we figure that rather than giving it to the surface that's going to wind up being sloughed off in a little while, we should give it to kind of the germinative cells that will continue to make that epithelium. And so in order to do that, we did this, we designed this experiment where we grafted a trachea onto a mouse's native trachea, a donor trachea. Um, and in this trachea, we killed off the cells. And here, here is kind of looks like that animal with double trachea sectioned up. And you'll kind of see, I'll just draw your attention to the right side, that a day after we start the experiment, all this epithelia dies and it just looks like scar. There's a couple of nuclei, some of them might be white cells. But a day later, you start to see kind of a lot of nucleated cells in the surface of that scar. And uh, in a week, you essentially have a restored epithelium and you have glands all throughout the base of that scar. So that's a pretty robust and remarkable regenerative capacity to re be able to make the whole thing in a week is not bad at all. And then when we look at that kind of regenerating epithelium, we see that it expresses that basal cell marker, but there's many, many more here than ordinarily should be. As though, I mean, we might guess that the basal cell somehow sensed this injury and went to town and just started replicating as fast as it could to resurface this epithelium. And then later on, it starts differentiating. So we're hoping that those labeled